Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ad Week webinar, Expand Your Reach with Multilingual Content, where we'll be talking about how to connect with global audiences at scale. Today's webinar is sponsored by Veritone. I'm Danielle Moore, Senior Manager here at Ad Week's Content Studio, and I'll be your host today. Before we begin, I just want to take a moment to make sure everyone knows what to expect from today's webinar and is familiar with the features of our platform. The actual presentation here should go somewhere in the 30 to 40 minute range, after which we'll have time for audience Q&A. So if at any point you have a question for one of our speakers, just use that Q&A tool beneath the video window on your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can after the end of the presentation. Also, it's not too late to invite your colleagues to join us at today's webinar. About 15 minutes ago, you received a final reminder email from us. In there, you'll find a link to the webinar registration page that you can share with your colleagues. There's still plenty of time for them to join us live, but if they can't, today's webinar is being recorded and they can always catch that on-demand version. In fact, that on-demand recording will be made available to all registrants. We'll be sending you a link later today when that's live around 3.30 Eastern or so. And if you like a PDF of today's slide deck, you can find that in the event resources area on your screen. As always, if you enjoyed today's webinar, definitely check out the full Adweek webinars calendar at adweek.com slash webinars. You can also find that linked below and you'll see what we have coming up and also get access to our archive of on-demand webinars as well. Now, let me introduce you to today's speakers. We're very happy to be joined by Sean King, SVP and GM, Commercial Enterprise at Veritone. Sean oversees the Commercial Enterprise Division at Veritone, including SAAS Technologies and Managed Services for Advertising, Licensing, Synthetic Media, and Metaverse. We're also pleased to welcome Brian Barletta, founder of Sounds Profitable. Brian founded Sounds Profitable to educate podcasting professionals about advertising and sales tech after successfully working with leading companies in the space, including Claritas, Megaphone, and Barometric. Well, we've got a lot of great content to dive into today, so let me bring our speakers up on screen here to get us started. Welcome, Brian and Sean. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Well, let's hop right in here. So one of the reasons that we're here today discussing this is because content in many spaces today is predominantly created and distributed in, in English, uh, even though we know that most of the world uh, considers a non-English language to be their native language. So I think the real first question to start off with, just to set the stage, is why are content creators still creating the majority of their content for English-speaking populations? Sean, you want to start us off there? Ah, I think you're muted, Sean. Of course, that's a good way to you know, start off the <laughs> webinar with a quick little speed bump. But uh, no, I think right now, the main reason why is, is just because that's the native language that they speak and it's what they're comfortable with and what they're creating with. And many are not recognizing that there's a lot of tools and technologies out there that can really help them expand into more multilingual. So right now, I mean, it's really just because that's what they speak and that's what they know and that's what they're using. And, you know, which herein lies the opportunity in which how they can connect with more people. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, like on the audio side, a lot of the experience that I've dealt with is that uh, the tools that we're building are geared towards the English speaking audience. I mean, even though podcasting, which is my primary platform, is so built out to enable anyone who can speak to record that and distribute it, the tools in that process up until very recently have been built around an English flow. Uh, and they're starting to expand. But yeah, I mean, I think that that's a big part of it. The tools and the majority of the people creating and consuming in these new mediums seem to be English first or focused or are willing to adapt to that language to come and consume it. Right. Absolutely. Um, so that helps us to set the stage a bit. And I think the logical next question after hearing a bit more about that context is whose responsibility is it, in your opinions, to ensure that content is inclusive? Well, I mean, I'll start with that one. I mean, the content creators uh, from there. I mean, and again, you know, the reach well, using audio, for example, using Brian's medium, like podcasting, for it's a, it's a low barrier to entry for a lot of folks to be able to create content, to engage with their followers and be able to do that. But, you know, if they want to expand their reach and want to be expand to be more inclusive of everyone, you know, that's either how they have to adjust their content, how they have to make it more accessible or more geared towards those different groups in order to kind of make it more inclusive. 
and again, there's a lot of different ways to be able to do that. It can be from the content creation, what type of content they're doing, and more so, you know, using some of those new tools that Brian alluded to before to be able to expand, you know, their current uh, content to be able to reach some more of those inclusive audiences. Yeah. I, I think it's also important to remember that if, if you don't do it as a publisher or the content creator, that someone's going to do it for you, right? Um, on Google Chrome, the website, the browser itself will translate any website I go to and do it to their point of view, their perspective, their dialect, every single thing that they decide to set on top of the content that it's consuming. If a publisher provided that option with the flag in the top corner and the dialect options and things like that, I feel more welcome if I don't you know, if it's not available in my language and, uh, you know, even selecting the difference between the U.S. and the U.K. on a website and being able to see differences and subtleties there uh, is really interesting to me versus just clicking that translate button up top. So I think I really do agree that the content creator, it is their responsibility. Um, but I don't I don't think that uh, the consumer is going to uh, suffer from that. I think that as this space continues to grow and content is expanded everywhere that the consumer will ultimately get what they want. But if the publisher doesn't put care into that, the consumer will notice. So true. So many good points there um, in terms of the accountability and the reality, right, about um, what consumers of different media are doing, um, whether the publishers are going to be mindful of this or not. Uh, so I think that logically leads into our next, you know, train of thought here, which is that today, uh, you know, brands have an incredible amount of content to consider, right? Uh, now many brands are also getting into the podcast space. They're taking on audio-based content for the first time or doing it in a uh, more concerted way, and many may have specific needs such as voiceover. Uh, so my question for you two is, what should brands be considering, particularly when it comes to audio content, first and foremost, and also voiceover content? Uh, Sean, you want to kick us off there as well? Sure, I'll kick us off there. Uh, you know, they need to be thinking about what are they trying to solve for? You know, we're seeing brands become more content creators as a way to continually engage with their consumer base. And, and so it's really about, you know, what are their overarching goals and how does this align with their marketing and how does it align with their go-to-market strategies and their sales strategies and really their client retention strategies that are there. I mean, it's a great way to stay involved and to keep your message in front of them and to kind of create that almost, you know, loyalty to the brand by, by just creating more content. And we're seeing brands across the, uh, the nation, not just even the globe, that are starting to kind of take these type of approaches and doing those. Uh, so I think you need to align it with, you know, again, what's your strategy from how am I acquiring a customer all the way through to how am I servicing to the lifetime value of the customer? And how can these different tools be available? And how can I use them to make sure that I'm staying engaged with my consumer base? Because we all brands spend so much time and so much money and so much strategy into the acquiring of customers and trying to open up their front doors as wide as they can to as let as many people in. And they're using these strategies to help keep them in the building, so to speak, and then kind of keep them engaged. Uh, so you just need to think about like, you know, at the end of the day, what's my strategy? Yeah, I like the I like the door strategy, right? Because to me, I think about this as opening multiple doors to the same destination, right? It's, you know, you might be able to open one really wide. And look, if there are brands out there that only sell to an English speaking audience, I actually envy you. Uh, you know, it sounds profitable as just educating and helping people in the space. I'm not only speaking to an English speaking audience. You know, our newsletter hits about 8,000 people on the English side and they're all hyper engaged. But the amount of additional people by focusing on other languages, I get to get or touch base with or see the way to interact with them, more ways to bring it to them. It's it's really eye opening because every single one of those when it's laser focused matter. And so I think that brands really need to think about how wide or how deep they need to go. And I think that's that's the real big thing. Like you need to determine. I, I think we're past the point of assuming that English only is going to work, but it depends. Like how many languages do you adapt to or how many dialects per those languages or do you narrowly focus on one or two? Do you expand one at a time or do you, you know, kind of throw it all out there and see what sticks. I think I think that's what, what Sean was kind of getting at. The brands need to determine their path. Absolutely. Yeah, certainly a lot to think about there. I do like the doors open analogy as well um, and the extension of it that you provided there, Sean, in particular, like keeping them in the building. I, I think of it almost more as like making the field home, right? Um, and when we're talking about something like multilingual content and languages, like that is part of what home is, right, for people. Exactly. Um, so and you're having that opportunity to, to meet the customer where they're at. 
and being able to communicate with them where they're at. And it, it can become just not just inclusive, but also a lot more personal. Right, exactly. Um, so on that note of talking about audio, let's talk a little bit more specifically about podcasts and, you know, podcasts as a case study here, um, making the case for how multilingual content can be super, super successful and effective, as Sean pointed out, at making uh, content feel more personal and personable, right, when you're endearing yourself to consumers as a brand or as a personality or a content creator. Um, so the question really is, why are podcasts such a great case study here when it comes to producing content in multiple language? Brian, I'm going to throw this to you first since I know podcasts are. Yeah. Um, you know, podcasting is, is just conversation, right? Or it's, it's scripted content. So, I mean, there's two options. It, this could be a podcast right here and then we can transcribe it. Uh, and then we have the text version of it or it's built off of a script. So it means we have a base that we're working off of. So being able to um, translate it, it's in podcasting, almost everybody at a, a level of monetization and a level of focus on growing themselves is transcribing or has the script available, being able to translate that, um, is relatively easy. I think that that's probably par one of the easiest parts of the process that we're working on or talking through here. Um, and then working with a partner to uh, adapt it to different languages, especially when all of the podcasts, um, the podcast players out there are really starting to provide different experiences when you set the language appropriately on the podcast or allow people who are prim primarily in an English language to identify Spanish speaking podcasts and, and other things like that. So I think, um, the value and the ease of podcasting there is that the, the conversation becomes text very quickly. The text becomes um, translatable and then you're right back into synthesizing it back into another audio experience. So you're able to create that full loop and expand in that same presentation. Got it. Yeah. Sean, anything to add there from your perspective about why podcasts make a great case study here? I mean, I mean, that was great points by Brian. I would say also, too, because podcasting is a lean in medium. You know, mm. when you're going to a podcast, you're seeking it out. It's something you want to engage with. It's something that you want to hear. It's something you want to learn about. And, and again, kind of being able to broaden that, not just to be able to have listeners in my language learn or be entertained or uh, about the podcast I'm creating, but there's going to be plenty others that are going to want to lean into that subject matter that you're talking about, because, you know, that's what I love about podcasting specifically is that, I mean, it's truly like the lean in on demand, you know, it's not like something that you're doing, like, you know, just in the background or other things for them, you're seeking it out. It, it's intentful listening. And, and again, so going back to that way, just being able to make that to more of an expansive audience uh, is, is, is just a great benefit for, the content creators, but also for the listeners and just having more things accessible to them. Yeah. You, you can't randomly scroll by a podcast. You can't like, it's not like flipping through channels. You can't accidentally listen to it and just be like, oh, this one's in Spanish. I'm 15 minutes into it. You knew what you picked. You decided to dig into it. And while, you know, in monetization of podcasts, we talk about large numbers, right? Tens of thousands of downloads per episode becomes the barrier for monetization for something like me. Uh, even even five new people listening to the Spanish language podcast is five people engaged enough with my content to seek something out in a format that works best for them and really consume it, really engage with it. And each one of those ends up being a conversation I end up having. They end up being someone who reaches out or a pathway to grow the business in that language. I love that. I love that example. And also just the idea that, you know, podcasts are conversations that people have to lean into very intently, and then they go on to generate more conversations. Um, great, great example of why um, it's just such a great medium that's going to continue to grow, but also why marketers should keep top of mind, you know, the opportunity here from a, from a multilingual perspective. So appreciate that. And since we have you on here, Brian, um, you've been distributing content in both English and Spanish for over a year. What made you decide to start creating content in Spanish? What was the fine, like, what was the, the impetus for you initially? Uh, Sans Profitable's main goal is to show people how all the technology works and show it as a hands-on example, uh, because I think that it's easy for people to dismiss the lift of things as too hard and, and really not go down that route. Uh, right now, as of today, Sans Profitable is uh, two partners, 
one part-time employee and then uh, contractors for like our, our some of our podcasts and things like that. So most of this stuff falls to me. And I wanted to show that I was capable of executing on a Spanish language podcast with a team of basically nothing to kind of raise the bar to show people that this is worthwhile. And then I wanted to see from there what what people bid on, right? Like, were they interested in it? Um, and, and honestly, the coolest part about it is I got challenged. People saw it and they said, this is really great. But what about unique Spanish content? And I said, that's really interesting. And I've used that to kind of make sure that not only is the content that we're creating available in multiple languages, but it's also something that the sources that we're basing that content on are not just of English origin, right? Like we're looking for content that is unique to a Spanish language country and the, the things that they're in, experiencing there so that we can provide not only the content in that language, but uh, like the stories of that to all of my audience. Absolutely. And I think the results that we can see here on this slide absolutely speak for themselves. Um, but I think we do actually have something else that will speak for itself that I want to make sure we get a chance to share with our audience, which is a clip of Brian's voice in Spanish. So let me play that so we can talk about it briefly here. Give me a second. Veritone Voice es una solución de clonación de voz que le permite crear y monetizar voces sintéticas de forma segura y ética. Ahora su talento puede escalar su voz sin tiempo de estudio, hablar en diferentes idiomas y monetizar su marca más rápido. La oferta de voz sintética de Veritone continúa mejorando y, como podcaster, esto solo hace que mi contenido y mi marca sean mucho más fuertes y accesibles you just heard i want to just i didn't want to preview this before we listen to it but that was not actually brian speaking spanish um brian doesn't speak spanish that was his voice clone so we're going to talk about that in a little bit but i just think that's such an interesting example um you know of how this can come into play and just to give everyone an audio example as well so moving into this idea of testing right my question for both of you is how can creating content, uh, specifically audio in new languages, look? What might this look like over time, uh, in your opinion? I'm guessing that voice quote is going to play into your answers. Brian, do you want to start us off here? Yeah, um, for me, like what it played into, right? Like what it taught me was all the different ways that I should approach this. Should I be hiring people that can write about content from other languages and not only giving them a platform, but also then translating their content into English? Should I be evaluating, um, uh, having people, you know, uh, natural language speak their own language and hire the host to speak both English and Spanish? Are there pathways, are there languages that, um, there were a few languages that we evaluated that I uh, quickly realized after, you know, we we thought about tests and I had uh, reached out to some people that those people would actually prefer to be in English because the people that do speak those languages found that in the business conversations they were having, it was more valuable for them to practice their English about these topics than to just hear it in something that was native for them. So, you know, that's those are all the things that this has opened up my mindset to explore. Absolutely. Anything to add there, Sean? Well, I mean, look, I mean, this is primarily an audience of advertisers and brands and, and, yeah. like, and this is very much kind of what we do. You know, you test, you evaluate, you respond, you adjust, you optimize, you know, you solve for the goal. And when you're thinking about voice and you're thinking about localization, I mean, it's just another dimension in which you need to think about. Like, it's always like, okay, well, what is my goal of trying to reach my customer? Okay, what medium am I using? What sound, like what messaging am I using? You know, what voice now am I using? And, and, and what language? And do I need to communicate differently from that voice into those different languages to optimal, to get the optimal response from the end consumer? Yeah. So again, it's just, it's the same metrics that we all do day in and day out. It's just adding like another dimension to that. The, the first conversation I had with the Veritone team about this was really interesting because I didn't view it as what door to open next. I viewed it as how many doors can we close quickly before I have a thousand podcasts in different languages. <laughs> These options are there. But, you know, you look at the statistics on podcasts out there 
the ones that sell the best and grow the best, you know, uh, a female hosted sports podcast really nail it. What happens if, you know, I want to try that in Spanish? What happens if we have all the content and we've created it and I want to expand into Spanish? I'm not limited to just being a synthetic version of my voice. Now I can explore a different host on that end. Right. There's so many different opportunities that I have with this to figure out what does and doesn't work. Maybe that's a great way if I'm done being a host to figure out will this land if it's not me, if it's not my voice, will it increase, will it decrease? Um, A-B testing and podcasting is really difficult because the idea of getting someone up to speed, understanding and familiar about uh, your show and test out a co-host. Well, I mean, if the relationship isn't there and the style isn't there, it doesn't matter how good their voice sound. Right. So can you figure out a way to sunset yourself from that? Um, I mean, we haven't even touched on the advertising capabilities yet, but the truth here is that all of these things are really exciting because it becomes another tool, another instrument. This isn't replacing anybody. I mean, we did a we did a test with um, uh, this voice mapping, which is really cool. Like my voice being mapped with someone else's voice over it. So what I'm speaking turns into their voice. There's amazing things that you can do with all of this and that needs to be fine tuned by a a uh, more educated engineer on how these tools work. You need a strong voice talent. If I don't get rid of that little bit left in my Boston accent, certain voices don't map correctly to it. Uh, so I think that this allows a small team to very quickly iterate, see what sticks without damaging their brand, and then dive deeper into what does stick. Absolutely. And I think that that leads us pretty naturally into our next question here, which is this idea of localization and how in this space it could potentially be customized. Um, so we're going to play a quick video just to give everybody another example here. Let's launch that. Hi, I'm Ann Ganguza, professional voiceover artist. Check out this AI clone of my voice. Advertising agencies, production companies, and film studios can easily translate existing English voiceover into new languages. Now listen to my AI voice clone say that in Spanish. Agencias de publicidad, compañías de producción y estudios de cine pueden traducir fácilmente la voz de narración en inglés existente a nuevos idiomas. Verified AI translated voices with Veritone. So the first thing that really stuck out to me when I first saw that video, which may be our audience's experience as well, I'm curious, um, is the fact that you really have to be paying attention to when it's Anne's real voice, because we see her speaking to us, and when it's her AI voice. It can be a little tough to tell. Um, so we'd love to hear both of your thoughts on this idea of localization, how what we just saw from Anne ties into that. Sean, do you want to kick us off for this? Sure, I'll kick us off. Uh, I mean, what you're seeing from those, I mean, it's really tough, tough to tell the, the difference between the two. I mean, you actually watched during the video, we put a disclaimer of when their and synthetic voice is actually being used. And I think what that really can think about is not just from the localization and being able to, to, to take that into multiple languages, like in Brian's example, but the ability to really localize and personalize it. I mean, you start thinking about, you know, talents across word, like, and we're all sharing the same message. Well, okay, well, if I'm a voice talent and I want me different messaging all across the country, you know, how am I going to be able to do that cost uh, efficiently and effectively and still being able to do it? If I want a personalized message for every DMA, I'm reading 210 different, you know, variations of it. Uh, and here's this ability to be able to take that and to be able to insert these, uh, to really be able to customize it down to whatever location that you want to have, down to, I mean, to really personalize a messaging. I mean, and to use a point that Brian said earlier, it becomes an amazing tool in the toolbox for these content creators mm -hmm. in a way that they can almost hyper-personalize a lot of their messaging uh, in, in unique ways. And again, on a lean in medium and other areas to be able to have it, it just, it's, again, it's a wonderful tool for these content creators. I, I think back a lot about um, uh, the old radio promos. I actually don't know if they still do this, but they put somebody on the camera and it's just like, here's the next three hours. Tell me how much you love this specific station in Boston, <laughs> right? Um, and being able to take that and the person just like record like a really passionate first run of it or a single run of it and use the synthetic voice for the rest of it. That's really awesome. I mean, it, it makes it more accessible. It makes it more accessible for that smaller uh, radio station to get in on that rotation or them to expand their reach on that. What I really like about this video is the passing back and forth. Um, 
I don't know if anybody knows this, but sometimes hosts and podcasting can be a little bit uh, um, high maintenance. I think <laughs> might be the right words I'd use. Um, uh, but like, you know, you get done with the recording and then they're just like, I'm done. I'm out of here. They're on to their next thing. And you, they flubbed a word. They said a, missed a sentence. They forgot a promo. They didn't read something right about the sponsor. The value of like my entire podcast being synthesized and, and translated into Spanish is awesome. But the idea that like we could use this to like fill holes, right? I'm out sick. My voice sounds like crap, but we have my synthetic voice that matches more closely to the last recording I have. A new advertiser comes in right now, and I have most of those pieces from something else there, but we can just fill that gap. We can fill 15 words without me like it just like the, the quality dropping. And that flow being there. And, and that's really what I highlight on those two tools and skills. Like this isn't replacing anybody. My voice is licensed in that situation. So either I gave approval for it or I'm making money off of it. The mm -hmm. engineer has to specifically have a set of skills where they know how to blend this together. With that, if you drop the music from all of that, if you dropped the editing and engineering that went into that, you'd notice those differences more. A skillful engineer managed to weave that together. So we're creating more jobs and opportunities here. And so that's like, that's the excitement for me. You can do a full fledged solution or you can pick and choose all the holes you want to fill in ways that just make your life easy. Now, Brian, that's a great point, And I agree. And also, you know, and again, to your point about thinking about the, the local communities around that, you know, you have all of these local advertisers that aren't being able to leverage a lot of these national personalities yeah. that are there. So it's giving them an opportunity to actually have a seat at the table. Like, am yeah. I a local dealer? Am I a local shop? Am I, you know, could I leverage these opportunities from these ones? You know, given that they have the right approvals, consents, and, and ability, it just it, it's it's giving everyone else a seat at the table. Well, audio is really well known for the the endorsement aspect, right? It's probably mm -hmm. the easiest way to get a celebrity endorsement um, for a brand. Right. Getting them on TV, on movie or on all these other things. That's that's a lot of effort. So the audio aspect is really interesting. And so I think about these giant chains that have local shops that are incredibly small or franchises. Right. Being able to not only just talk about like, uh, you know, work with your local realtor and just say it like that, but having the option for every local realtor to work with them and geo target a specific area. And now you have Shaq basically saying, you know, work with Brian's realtor shop located here where he's done the big aspect of it there but i can pay in for that smaller part i can be part of that bigger campaign that will never happen right that's that's what's really attractive we're, we're not even talking just local we're talking micro right there's mm -hmm. there's opportunity here for big companies to extend down to every small part and and really endorse their entire brand it's so interesting to just hear you both unpack all of that. Uh, and I want to dive a little bit deeper into this technology. And, you know, we've seen, we've heard two examples of AI voice clones so far today with the video and the audio. Um, but I would love to just break it down a little bit further. So the question is, how does custom voice cloning or AI voice actually work? Sean, why don't you kick us off there? Well, uh, happy to. Uh, it first starts with consent. I mean, that's the first and foremost. Uh, you know, there's a lot of technology out there, and obviously you hear a lot in the space about deep fakes and cloning, deep cloning, and all the, you know, what we'll call, I'll consider more of the negative connotations around voice cloning that's there. But it first starts with consent. You know, we do not make any voices unless we have consent of the individual uh, to be able to do that. And then it starts with, so once we have that, then it's the collection of the training data, you know, in order to be able to do that. So we can either have the content creator uh, read specific scripts or do anything, or we can take existing content that they've already created and use that as the training data to create their synthetic voice. And then once we've done that, that ability to be able to take that training data and be able to convert it into multiple languages in order to be able to create those clones in all those different languages. So podcasting is a great example for with like Brian, for example, because he's creating content all the time. Right. He's got a great setup. He's got high fidelity audio that he's creating daily. So that right there is the perfect foundation uh, for the training data in order to be able to create, you know, these voice clones. Got it. So it's good to understand just a little bit more about how it works and even further why podcasts are such a great use case there, right? Because there's already a bank um, of great training data, which of course is always going to be essential with AI to create that fidelity that you're looking for. Um, amazing. Brian, anything else to add from your experience? I know you shared a little bit further um, in the last question. Yeah. Um 
here's the truth of it. I wouldn't be doing this if Veritone's first focus wasn't consent. Uh, one of the first things we did was we went to a conference uh, last December, um, uh, Voice AI, and every single thing we talked about was consent. It was barely about the technology. Everybody understood how it works. Everybody understood the value, but it was the rights, the consent, the monitoring, um, the approval process of it. Veritone, since before they started offering this feature, that was their focus there. And there are a lot of other tools out there, especially in the audio space, that just offer these. And that's not talked about. And it's neat, right? Because I can use a piece of software on my computer that's processed enough of my audio to be able to fill in specific words, but we don't think about what the long-term aspect of that is. There are people out there doing AI-generated art right now. They're putting their phone number into these applications and their pictures. And look, the art comes out really cool and I'm tempted, but I don't know their privacy policy. I don't know what they're gonna do with that. I don't know their rights, I, but I do know what data I've sent them. I do, and I knew all of those connections, and that's scary, right? What happens next with AI, what happens next with our voice and our photos is really important for anywhere from privacy to uh, like licensing, right? Like, I, it sounds probable, may not be massive. I hope everybody here comes and checks it out. That'd be really great. But it's not like I'm not licensing this to Saturday Night Live. They're not going to use a Brian Barletta avatar and pay me to, to have me come co host something. Um, but it is still really important. It's a brand, it's part of my identity. So knowing the rights of that, knowing how that works is critical. And I think that that's how we move a space forward. The quickness of getting that AI translated stuff out there, getting it out there and showing how cool it is, is awesome. Having a, a demo of Obama sounds really neat, but like those aren't approved. And that's really an important thing. That's really what attracted me to this and let me know that this is a space that's going to be defended. It's 75% of the effort out there is trying to remind people that this is opt-in, this is licensed, this is approved, and this isn't deep fakes, something that they're going to spend a substantial amount of time fighting against. Yeah, and that I, I thank you for saying that, Brian, because it's an, it's an important aspect. And there's a lot of organizations that you know everyone participates in, like the Open Voice Network, even the IAB and others are really trying to lean in on exactly what you're talking about. You know, And we just kind of stand by the principle, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, <laughs> very, very true. And that's the hard part when those demos, when those companies that come up with a neat idea and want to go really quick do it, they can't show you Ryan's voice, the CEO of Veritone, which might not land with anybody. They show you Obama, they show you Hugh Jackman, they show you someone that resonates with you already. And that's a line. That's a line that we have to be aware of that's not okay to cross because if we want to grow this respectfully and correctly and not create fear and actually create a business around it, we need to do it the right way. And that's, you know, uh, I, I really would not have lent my voice to something like this or tried out something like this if I didn't believe it was safe. Very well said, both of you. Thank you so much for sharing all of these insights. Um, I would love to move us into the Q&A portion now to have some time to take some questions from our audience. As we mentioned before, we do have time to take a few questions here, and we'll get to as many questions as we can over the next five to ten minutes or so. If we don't get to your question to our audience members, just know we always make sure they get forwarded over to our sponsor so they have the opportunity to possibly reply offline. First, a couple of quick reminders here from Adweek. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be available on demand later this afternoon. We'll be emailing everyone a link to that recording, so keep an eye out for it. And if you would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can find a PDF in the event resources area on your screen. Now, let's get to some of these questions. Our first question here. So we did definitely talk about quite a few examples today, just sort of riffing as well as looking at, um, you know, the audio that we had earlier and the video of Anne, um, you know, of how this works, right? But can you give some further examples of how computer generated voice can be used in advertising? Uh, sure, I can take that one. I mean, there's a couple examples here on kind of the success we'll leave up on the, the screen here. Uh, but a lot of it is is in the localization of these. Uh, you're seeing it a lot in the promo codes that go out and the unique readouts that are happening in a lot of audio ads. You know, mm -hmm. you have a voice talent that going into the audience is like, hey, here's my read, but now I have 500 different unique promos or different things that I want to be able to customize and, and localized down to either specific channel, specific geo that's being used. And, and that's being used right now in, in a multitude of different mediums. Got it, yeah. So it seems like uh, the answer to that one is anything that involves voice with the right consent, right? Absolutely, right. but can potentially be a candidate for this. I have, I have a funny example here. Um, do you know that a lot of Australians hate American English accents? 
No, I was not aware. Yeah, they uh, they tend to do really bad advertising wise. If you're listening to an Australian podcast and you get an ad in there, and uh, the ad is American English, uh, it doesn't convert as well. So even the dialects on English are really interesting things to explore. Like how else can you explore this? The dialects matter. If they matter in English, they matter in other languages too. So being able to have that taken care of, being able to have that local appeal uh, is really powerful because it can impact conversion rate. In podcasting specifically, we tend to uh, move too quickly away from the creative. We assume it's the association with the host or the show or whatnot. This mm. allows real A-B testing. This allows differences in languages too. Absolutely. Yeah. It's good to hear that it has a lot of opportunity for nuance and testing there, um, especially for folks who may be trying it for the first time. Right. Um, the next question here is sort of a matter of medium tech where this can be translated. And the question is, can something like this be deployed on a website? Absolutely. I mean, and candidly, you see it right now in many use cases when you go onto a site and you see the little icon where you can say, listen to this article. Right. And do those. So you're seeing those here now, but being able to kind of take that a step further, if you're a brand and you have an ambassador, you'd be able to do that. Do you want to have that enabled into all of your articles that you're publishing and be able to do that? So again, you can use these different tools as a further extension of, uh, of, of your brand and the content that you're creating. Uh, so yeah, there's plenty of these widgets that are available to be able to do that, but it's like, okay, well, who do you want it to say? And, and how do you want it to speak? And those uh, are kind of those questions that you can ask yourself. Got it. Yeah. And I'm guessing that translates to like in app as well, potentially, would there be space for that there? Cool. Yeah, definitely good to know more about that. But, you know, it's, it's always interesting to see where um, people come from. There, there is a futuristic element to what we're talking about today, right? So um, understanding just the different ways that it can be deployed on our current media is cool. Um, the next question I have here, which I think is a really good one, especially when we're talking about the nuances of things like dialect, right? Um, and we're also talking about consent and how important that is here as well. How do you make sure that the content is properly translated? Uh, is AI used for all of it? Are there other safeguards in place? What does that look like? Uh, well, there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, yes, there's definitely AI ML models that are being used for those ones here. And then there's this notion that can be deployed of what we'll call like human on the loop. So for a perfect example, like a podcast, you know, you can take an English podcast, you have the transcription that can be created using uh, a, a, an ML model. You can take that and you can translate that. And some, right now, the ML models for a lot of those translations are really good. You know, but it may not solve for that exact localization for that means. Like, for example, we say, let's take five. Like, we know what let's take five means here. Like, okay, take, but if you're putting that into Cantonese or, or, or something else, we're like, well, what are we taking five of? Uh, it may not, like, localize to those direct languages. So there are those notions then of, like, what we'll consider a human on the loop, where it's like, okay, you've used AI and ML to, trans uh, to transcribe it. You've used it to translate it. Okay, at that point, then, do you maybe want to have a human just to review it real quick and just to make sure that it, you know, is really hitting to the specifics of that uh, language that you're putting it through. And then obviously then processing through, you know, the uh, a synthetic model, getting your, your, your voice outcome. So are those notions? And there, we're seeing both being used across where someone are going straight uh, uh, machine all the way through the entire process and are loving results. And then there are some that, you know, just want that little extra attention to be able to do it. It really is at the discretion of the content creator. And what's really great about that is that the AI and machine learning aspect of it can start to detect when you say take five and know that it might be worthwhile to loop that human in. So the more they process and the more people flag this appropriately, the better these models grow to make it more efficient. The more efficient it is, the more affordable it is, the faster it's processed. Um, We've been very late sending articles over recently to have them translated. And I'll tell you, the Veritone team is very fast at sending it back to me. So the efficiencies in it from when we started to where we are now, it's quick even with a human on board. Um, and, and again, that creates more jobs, right? <laughs> Think of how many times, like in earlier in my life and working career, like the amount of people who just happen to speak Spanish and were just expected to apply that skill. We're moving absolutely towards a world where that's a specialty, but being imagine being able to just be a writer competent in multiple languages and take part in this. 
right? Give feedback, adapt that, grow it appropriately, and save that person the ability from day one spinning up an entire team of people to create that local content, but instead taking and perfecting a translation. So interesting uh, to hear both of your perspectives on the process. Thank you so much for all of these insights. Uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions here today. I would like to thank our speakers, Sean and Brian, for being here, as well as our sponsor, Veritone. Some final reminders here from Adweek. Make sure you download the slides from that event resources area on your screen and check your email for a link to the on-demand recording, which will be available later today. As always, if you enjoyed today's webinar, be sure to check out the Adweek webinars calendar to learn more about our upcoming events at adweek.com slash webinars, also linked below. Again, big thank you to Brian and Sean for being here, for letting us pick your brains about this. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. As always, we look forward to seeing everyone at an upcoming Adweek webinar. Thank you.